statistics tell us that 95% of the people on this earth, just about all of them say they believe in a God. In fact, the vast majority of mankind on this earth will claim that they believe in a God. Now those same statistics tell us, according to one Gallup poll that was conducted right here in the United States, for every 100 people that you asked whether or not they believed in God, yes, 95 of them would tell you, I do. 95 would say, I am a believer. Yes, I believe in God. Now that raises some very significant questions. One of the questions that is raised is, do all of these believers, these supposedly believers, do all of these believers really try to discern what God requires of them, and are they trying to live their lives in harmony with that? Another question that comes up, do they take the time to find out what God's requirements are? And a third question that is closely linked with the other two, are they giving serious thought to God's requirements, and do they strive to live their lives accordingly each day? You see, now we've introduced an entirely different matter. On the one hand, you have the vast majority saying they believe in God. But on the other hand, how many people are actually concerned with what God would have them to do? Let's look in our Bibles at the book of James chapter 2 and verse 19. Now, this is why it's so important for us even to consider the question, are we doing what God requires of us? In the book of James chapter 2 and verse 19. Now, note what the Bible says. You believe there is one God, do you? You're doing quite well, and yet the demons believe and shudder. Well, now, according to this verse, just to say that you believe in God, well, that's not quite good enough. Actually, more is required of a person than just simply saying they believe in God. If you look at the deplorable conditions that are being done on this earth, if you look at the hatred, the greed, the crime, the prejudice, you look at all the immorality that's taking place, it's being done on the part of those that claim that they believe in God, not just the atheists and the agnostics. In fact, note what the Bible tells us in the book of Titus, chapter 1. Now, let's turn there also in our Bibles, in the book of Titus, chapter 1, and let's consider together verse 16. Titus, chapter 1, and verse 16. Note the Bible says again, they publicly declare they know God, but they disown him by their works, because they are detestable and disobedient and not approved for any good work of any sort. Well, here the Bible says, now there are some that claim that they know God, but based on the things that they do, they're really disowning him by their works. So it's not enough just to say that I am a believer, which the vast majority of mankind, they're saying that. But there are works involved. There are things that one must do in order to say or live their lives in such a way that they're meeting God's requirements. Well now, there we have it. We have two sides, and the question is, where do you stand on this issue? You have the vast majority of mankind on this side that they claim that they are believers, but they live their lives in whatever way they would like. Many of them live their lives in such a scandalous lifestyle. They disregard all of God's requirements, and as soon as they win something, what do they say? Well, I'd like to thank God. See, they claim they know God, but based on the way they live their lives, they disown Him. Now, on the other side of the issue, 
You have a limited number, a small group compared to the six billion that are on this earth. They not only claim that they believe in God, but they're living their lives in such a way that they're constantly trying to discern what all of God's requirements are, and they're trying to live their lives accordingly. Two sides, and it's good for us to ask ourselves this morning, where do I stand? It's not enough just to say, I'm a believer. But more is required. In fact, this so-called belief or this faith without works, the Bible says it's dead. So, it's important for all of us then to try to discern what God's requirements are. Since there are two sides to this issue, and we clearly want to be on the appropriate side. Well, that means that constantly we would want to live our lives in such a way of trying to discern what God's requirements are. And when we use this term requirements, uh, what are we actually talking about? What do we really mean when we ask this question, are you doing what God requires of you? Well, basically we're saying, are you doing what God insists upon? Are you meeting Jehovah's demands? Are you living up to his necessary standards? Are you doing what God is asking? That's what we mean when we ask the question, are you doing what God requires of you? Now here's a fair question, just to be fair about it and to be honest. A fair question could be, how can man know what God's will is for us? How could we know what God's standards are? If someone were here on the earth and they legitimately wanted to know that, how could they know what God's standards are that they're supposed to live up to? How would they know what's necessary? First of all, the true God, he is alive. He's concerned with man. But perhaps if anyone's here for the first time, we want to set your mind at ease or something. Uh, Jehovah God is not going to come down and speak to you individually just to tell you what your requirements are in order to meet his requirements. He's not going to do that. You're not going to hear a little voice audibly that tells you from time to time, uh, this is what you're supposed to do. Jehovah's not doing that here in this time of the end, according to the Bible understanding. But here's how one would know. Note what the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 15. This is of interest to us today because uh, that is a fair question that may come up. How can we know what God's will is for us? In Romans chapter 15, uh, let's read together in verse 4. Yes. Now note what the Apostle Paul tells the congregation there in Rome. He said, For all things that were written aforetime were written for our instruction, that through our endurance and through the comfort from the Scriptures we might have hope. Well, how would one learn what God's standards are? Well, the Bible says all things that were written aforetime were written for our instruction. That means in the Scriptures. In God's Word, the Bible, Jehovah clearly tells us what he would have us to do. So if someone is trying to live their life in such a way that they constantly want to discern God's standards, then they would consult God's Word, the Bible. Now throughout his Word, the Bible, this message from God, he tells us his personality. God tells us the things that he likes and the things that he dislikes. In fact, Jehovah wanted us to understand that so much that he clearly dealt with a specific people for a long period of time. He clearly dealt with the nation of Israel. Now, he gave them the Mosaic Law and that kept them separate from all other nations. And for years, that was the people that we're supposed to live up to God's requirements. So that means if we examine God's dealings with the nation of Israel, we can learn something about God. Because the Bible says all things were written aforetime, why? They were written for our instruction. So if we look at how God dealt with the nation of Israel, if we look at the results of them meeting God's standards and the results of them disobeying God's standards, then we can learn an answer to that question. How will one know? For example, 
His requirements to Israel were not oppressive. They were not something that they could not meet as people. And as long as the nation of Israel met God's standards, met his requirements, they had success in their life. Whenever they disregarded God's standards, whenever they disregarded all that Jehovah God felt was necessary for them, their lives ended up in disaster. So why don't we do this? Let's take a section of the Bible that was written specifically for the nation of Israel. Now the reason why we want to zero in on this particular section, we'll just examine some of the words of one of the prophets that God sent to that nation. Because we want to try to make sure that we clearly understand, uh, based on the scriptures, all things written aforetime for our instruction, let's make sure that we clearly understand what God would have us to do today. If you really wanted to narrow it down and say, well, really, what is God requiring of me? We should be able to narrow it down clearly in the Bible. You know, you should be able to say it in just one sentence. Because usually when something is so important, when it's a life and death matter, it's hard to memorize an entire paragraph, isn't it? Certainly a whole book. But just in one sentence, we should be able to say, oh, now that's what God's required of me. Now I know what to do, and I'll be able to find favor in his eyes. I'll be able to live forever. Here's the question. Can you answer it now? There are many that are believers, but they're not concerned really with what God requires of them. They're not even trying to find the answer. And it's not enough to believe. If your life depended on it, could you sum it up right now? What is God requiring? Remember the vast majority of mankind, they're not even concerned. But there is a group. They're concerned with meeting God's requirements. Well, let's turn and see what the prophet said. Now, the prophet we have in mind is the prophet Micah. All right? He was a prophet. Now, someone are saying, but now wait a minute. You're going all the way back in ancient history. This is 2002. Why are you going all the way back there? See, that's, that's what some people might say. Well, I thought you were getting ready to give us something that would affect my life right now, today. Well, give us a minute, because we are. But let's turn to what the prophet Micah had to say about this. And in the New World Translation, that's found on page 1181, it kind of starts right there. What we refer to as one of the minor prophets. We don't necessarily look at this particular book of the Bible that often. But certainly today, it adds so much weight to our discussion. So we need to turn to the book of Micah. Now, just in case a person is saying, why go all the way back to ancient history? Why go back well over 2,000 years? Well, here's the reason why. In Micah chapter 1, look at verse 2. Because some might say, how do we know it applies today? Well, verse 2 says, Hear, O you peoples, all of you. Now, if someone tries to wiggle out and say, well, that's still not all of us, note what verse 2 says, Pay attention, O earth. Now, if you're not living on the earth, it doesn't apply to you. If you're on this earth, it doesn't matter when this was written, it still tells us what God is requiring of us. The Bible says, all of you, listen. If you're on the earth, I'll tell you what I require of you. And God had it recorded. He had Micah write it down. So right at the beginning of this particular book, we began to realize, well, this is a section of the Bible. I can come and find out what God's standards are. I can meet all that's necessary that God would have me to do. Well, let's look at verse 2 again. Hear, O peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and what fills you. And let the sovereign Lord Jehovah serve against you as a witness, Jehovah from his holy temple. Well, now, what you're going to find, as Jehovah had his prophet explain this to his people, what you're going to find, that true worship really affected every aspect of a person's life. 
true worship really should affect our entire being. There's no part, there's no aspect of our lives that is exempt from God's standards. Because he's the sovereign of all the universe. So that means he has the right to set the standards for us. Now the nation of Israel at this time, they were in a very wayward or deplorable spiritual condition. They were not really meeting God's standards. They weren't really doing what God wanted them to do. Many were over here with this group. They weren't really concerned, and yet they were God's covenant people. They had been promised to God. They were like a wife to God. And yet they were living over here in such a way as though it was like a wife that had just been married. She took all her vows to her husband, and now she goes out and starts selling herself as a prostitute with other men. Well, that's, that's really what the nation was doing. So in a spiritual sense, if a person is not really concerned with what God's standards are, if they're not concerned with what God feels is necessary, it's really likened to a wife becoming unfaithful and just hiring herself out as a prostitute. Now note what Jehovah told the nation. In Micah chapter 1, let's look at verse 7. In Micah chapter 1 and verse 7. Jehovah starts to get to the uh, root of this matter. He says, And her graven images will be crushed to pieces, and all the gifts made to her as a hire will be burned in the fire, and all her idols I shall make a desolate waste. For from the things given as the hire of a prostitute she collected them, and to the thing given as the hire of a prostitute they will return. So Jehovah's really telling us how he feels. See, here this was a time when the nation of Israel had got involved not only with immorality, but they had couched it in between idolatry. So now these nations that were around them, they served false gods, and it involved idolatry. One of the nations, in fact, was uh, the Assyrian nation. So instead of the people being faithful to the only true God, they started bringing gifts or sacrifices, and they were bringing them up, really, to this false God. Things had become that bad. And so Jehovah says, well, that's, I'm going to crush all those to pieces. He's telling us how he feels. He said, uh, those are not meeting my standards. Jehovah says, really, you're like hiring yourself out like the hire of a prostitute. So Jehovah views idolatry on the part of people who profess to belong to him. He views it as deplorable as prostitution. Now a major part of heathen worship of those nations that surrounded Israel, a major part of their worship was sexual immorality and idolatry. That was the very heart of heathen worship. Now this same viewpoint of mixing idolatry, immorality, in with worship, well, that's in vogue today. People feel that sex should be free, freely participated in, without it causing a disruption in their relationship with God. And so the vast majority of mankind, don't you notice that sexual immorality and all forms of idolatry are a part of their lives, and they still say, well, I'm a believer. You see, that's the problem. They're not they're trying to discern what God is really requiring. And if people are not careful, even those that are involved with true worship would get involved with these same things. And they would feel that it shouldn't cause a problem in their relationship with Jehovah. But God told the nation of Israel exactly how he feels about it. This so-called new morality today, well, that's the same problem. However, it's important for us to realize something. That the problem that the nation of Israel had, their major problem was not necessarily the literal components that involved idolatry. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, 
bringing up these sacrifices to the false gods. Now, that was bad in itself. But their major sin was not just the literal components of immorality. Their major sin was they put something else in place of Jehovah. Now, why is it so important for us to realize that? Well, because today, all forms of sexual immorality, any form that we take today where we idolize people today, that's idolatry. We're actually putting things in the place of our relationship with God. Now, Satan, the devil, wants to do all that he can to disrupt our relationship with Jehovah. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. In the Bible of Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul realized the major problem that they had. So here in Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul zeroes in on something. And we do well to consider our desires, the things that we like. Colossians chapter 3, notice what verse 5 tells us. Deaden therefore your body members that are on the earth as respects, notice this, fornication, uncleanness, sexual appetite, hurtful desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. See, that was the real problem. They didn't realize that all of those things were actually idolatry and that's what the problem is today so if a person is constantly fantasizing and thinking about sex constantly fantasizing and thinking about immoral things the Bible says that's that's really idolatry you're over in that camp now the Bible tells us that each one of us is really enticed and drawn out by our own desires. Let's look at James, uh, what the uh, Bible writer James had to say about this. In James chapter 1, because now that we see the primary sin back then was not so much as the literal components, it's just the fact that they put something else in place of Jehovah. Uh, Let's look at James chapter 1 and look at verse 14. James said, but each one is tried by being drawn out and enticed by his own desires. You know what's so interesting about this verse? Verse 14, here where he says, but each one is tried by being drawn out. The actual Greek term is they're baited on. Now, are there any fishermen in the audience? Gotta raise your head. Okay, now on the next question, you may not be so proud, so I know you may not raise your hand. Now we have fishermen in the audience, but have you ever gone fishing and didn't catch a thing at all? I know you don't raise your hand on that one. So, are the fish in any danger just because you dropped your bait? Were they in danger just because you dropped your bait? No. They weren't in danger because you dropped your bait. You drop plenty of bait and you never caught anything at all. The problem is, when the fish began to desire your bait, they were baited on, they were drawn out. See, fish swim in schools. They rest in what's called retreats. And when you drop your bait, it's only that bait that draws them out. And then that leads to sin. Now, some fish like worms. Some rats like cheese. What do you like? That's how Satan the devil's going to bait on you. That's how he's going to draw you out. And you may not even participate in the thing that you're fantasizing about. It's just the fact that it has taken the place of Jehovah. That's the primary sin. That is idolatry. And it disrupts your relationship with God. You're not going to be able to meet the standard. You will not live up to what he's requiring of you. An idol? Note the definition of an idol. 
An idol is simply some object or symbol for which one has intent, passionate devotion, veneration, or worship. That's an idol. So whatever you become so devoted to, whatever you have this deep, passionate desire for, whatever you almost say, well, I would venerate this as worship, that has taken the place of Jehovah. It's like the nation of Israel. They were hiring themselves out as a prostitute. And we live in a world of mankind where man is used to giving glory to one another. They're used to receiving glory from one another. That's why we have the famous Halls of Fame. We have the Football Hall of Fame. I think that's here somewhere in Ohio. The Baseball Hall of Fame. The Basketball Hall of Fame. If if you uh, can think of it, they'll make a Hall of Fame and put you there. Now, I'm not being facetious. There's a Hall of Fame for people that did not accomplish anything at all. If you live 55 years and you can prove that you did not accomplish anything at all, they'll put you in the Hall of Fame for those that didn't accomplish anything at all. That's true. See, we live in a world of mankind where they're used to idolizing. That'll cost us our lives, because really, that's idolatry. Well, there were other deplorable conditions there in the nation of Israel. Many were stealing. Many were being prejudiced. They were taking sides with those that appeared to be rich. The judges, the priests, and the prophets, they were only uh, operating for the money. Some people were being very fraudulent. Some were oppressing others. There was bloodshed. There were vast amounts of injustice. It was even precarious at that time to trust your family or your friends. That's how bad things were. And yet, let's face it, don't we live in those times today? That's why what Micah said at that time, why it still applies to us today. Well, through Micah, Jehovah showed that he requires people to be honest, really, even in their business practices. Notice what the Bible tells us. Let's go back to the book of Micah. And here there's something else that uh, the prophet Micah helps us to see. In the book of Micah, chapter 2, this time. In Micah, chapter 2, we're going to read verse 1 and also verse 2. In Micah chapter 2, let's start with verse 1 and see if you can realize what Jehovah's standards are. Woe to those who are scheming what is hurtful, or harmful rather, and those practicing what is bad upon their beds. By the light of the morning they proceed to do it, because it is in the power of their hand. Why, yes, the Bible says, woe to those who are scheming. So we cannot take the view that our business practices should be separate from our Christian lives, which is the view that many have. Right, if you look at all of the many scandals today about fraudulent companies and so forth, many of them remember our believers. They claim to believe in God. But yet they let the business aspects of their lives, they try to separate that. And if we're not careful, true Christians today could get caught up into that same trap. Well, Jehovah says that's that's really like scheming. And that's not meeting his standards. That's not living up to something that he is requiring. And some individuals like to take advantage of their own brothers and sisters. They like to take advantage of the uh, close Christian ties and relationships that they have. Well, again, Jehovah says that's that's not really meeting my standards. Remember, the conditions were so bad at that time that Jehovah specifically had to send this prophet to try to turn that nation around. Very deplorable conditions. And remember, that's the time period in which we live in today. Now, in the midst of all of this fraud, immorality, all of this idolatry, there was still a group of people in the midst of all of this that were over here, they were with this other group. In spite of all of that, in that nation of Israel, there was still a group of people that were living their lives in such a way that they would meet 
what God would have them to do. Well, is that the case today? Remember, a person still might be asking the question, uh, but that still doesn't tell me what God requires of me. That just tells me that they were in bad shape back then. Well, today, can we say that there are a group of people that are working hard to live their lives the way Jehovah would have them to live their lives? Let's look at the book of Michael again. And Micah chapter 4 this time. And Micah chapter 4. And here the Bible says that even in the midst of all of this, there would be people that feel differently. In Micah chapter 4, let's read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll talk about them just a little bit. But let's see what the Bible actually says. And it must occur in the final part of the days that the mountain of the house of Jehovah will become firmly established above the top of the mountains, and it will certainly be lifted up above the hills, and to it peoples must stream. And many nations will certainly go and say, Come, you people. Now notice this. Let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will instruct us about his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion law will go forth, and the word of Jehovah out of Jerusalem. And he will certainly render judgment among many peoples, and set matters straight respecting mighty nations far away. And they will have to beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning shears. They will not lift up sword, nation against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. And they will actually sit each one under his vine and under his fig tree, and there will be no one making them tremble. For the very mouth of Jehovah of armies has spoken. Does this give you a clue that the Bible says that in the final part of the days, the last days, the time period in which we find ourselves today, the Bible says there would be individuals that are saying, well, let's go and let Jehovah instruct us. Let's let him set matters straight between all of these nations. So those that are really meeting God's requirements today, they're looking for instruction from Jehovah. They want him to instruct them. They're not joining with all of these other nations in war. They're not joining with all these people in crime and greed and dishonesty and injustice. There is a group of people today that are meeting God's standards. And what a grand privilege that anyone would have on the earth today to be associated with that people, to be a part of that. But did you notice something? Let's go back and look at verse 2. Now verse 2 there in Micah chapter 4 says, And many nations will certainly go and say, Come you people and let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will instruct us. Well at that time, people usually worshipped on a mountain. They would grab the highest hill and that's where they would set their sacrifices, and they would light their sacrifice, and people could see from all over. They could look over there and say, well, there's Obed again. He's, he's making a sacrifice to God. And they'd look at someone else and say, well, there's Joshua. He's making a sacrifice to God. So you wanted to get a hill or some type of mountain and set your sacrifice, and that's where you would worship God at that time. Well, if you notice, the Bible says that in the final part of the days, there would be other hills, there would be other mountains, but there's one that would be up above all of these other hills. And Jehovah says, I'm elevating worship. The only way you're really going to worship me, you're going to have to come all the way up here to this elevated plane of worship, and that's where you'll worship me. There are people doing that today. Now, if you don't want to be clean, if you don't want to clean up your life, well, you have to worship your God on one of these lower hills, but you can't come up on this mountain. Now, if you want to be prejudiced and you don't like people and you're always having fights and you're bucking against the brothers and the sisters here in the Kingdom Hall, then you need to leave because Jehovah doesn't do that up here on this mountain. Now, you can do it on one of these lower hills and then one of these other areas that are not concerned with meeting God's standards. But Jehovah says, we don't do it up here. He's elevated, pure worship. That's what's taking place today. And there are people today are saying, let's go to that kingdom hall. Let's go and let Jehovah instruct us 
He's going to set matters straight. And what a privilege we have to be up on this mountain and learn what God would have us to do. There's no other people that have that. Now, there are other believers that they claim they believe in God. But how many every day are studying the Bible and really trying to discern exactly what God would have them to do? And they're over here on this elevated mountain of worship. Yes, here in these last days, there are individuals that are meeting God's requirements. But that still leaves the question, though. Well, now that I see all of these bad things that we're not supposed to do, how can I still find out what God would have me to do? Well, let's look at Micah chapter 4. Because obviously, according to chapter 4, there are people that would want to know what God is, would have them to do. Micah chapter 4, verse 1. I just want to cite that one again. And it must occur in the final part of the days that the mountain of the house of Jehovah will become firmly established above the top of the mountains. And it will certainly be lifted up above the hills. And to it, peoples must stream. There is a particular place you have to go. It's above all these other hills. There is a particular place, and when people stream there, that's how they find out God's requirements. That's how we're able to answer the question, are we doing what God requires of us? So now, in a positive sense, now that God is here instructing us, it should be clear what he wants us to do. Well, Michael told us. Micah explained it clearly. Now, before we read that section, there's something we need to re recognize. Yes, that that nation of Israel, remember now, they were so bad that when Micah came and tried to correct them, they really kind of answered in a somewhat disrespectful way. Have you ever been uh, corrected or have you ever tried to correct someone? I think parents know of this quite often. But sometimes you try to help someone, maybe someone on your job or your assignment, maybe they may be viewed as a subordinate, and you're trying to correct them, and they kind of say, well, what was I supposed to do? Have you ever noticed that? Or maybe you try to explain something to someone, say, well, the way you kind of handled that, that wasn't the best way. Well, what did you expect me to do? They were doing that. What else was I supposed to do? Can you believe that the nation of Israel had the nerve to do that with you? in such deplorable conditions that they were in, with all of the terrible things that they were doing, when Jehovah sent the prophet there to try to correct them, do you know they had the nerve to say that? And if we're not careful, whenever Jehovah tells us what's necessary, whenever he tells us what his standards are, if we're not careful, we can react the same way today. We can say, well, what was I supposed to do? I'm living in the last days. The people are getting on my nerves. I had to slap them. What was I supposed to do? Just let him walk all over me? No, that's what people will say. Well, I know we're supposed to do that, but not in this particular case. That's what will take place today. But now, remember now, you're supposed to be a believer. You're not with the vast majority to just claim that they believe in God, but are not really trying to live up to his requirements. No, you're working hard to discern, according to what the Bible says, all these things that were written aforetime were written for our instruction. So we're constantly trying to live our lives, trying to order our lives in such a way that God would look at us and say, they're meeting my standards. They're doing what I feel is necessary. Not what he feels is necessary. Not what she feels is necessary. But they're doing what I feel is necessary. But that unfaithful nation of Israel, as a whole, they didn't do that. There was still a small group. They were living up to God's standards. But the vast majority of them, they weren't concerned. Let's look at Micah chapter 6 this time. 
in Micah chapter 6. Now, we're going to start reading at verse 6, and this is their response. Now, in other words, as the entire nation, keep in mind now, they're saying, well, what was I supposed to do? Now, here's what they do. They give five possibilities. Micah's trying to talk with them. Now, the way Jehovah had Micah write this, Micah was allowed to mention things, really, that was the response of the nation. They give five possibilities. What are we looking for? We're looking for what is God requiring of us today? We want to narrow it down. We want to put it in one sentence, keep it nice and clear, because our lives are involved. But now they give five possibilities. We're going to put them all out there. Now let's look at the first one, Micah chapter 6 and verse 6. Notice their response. With what shall I confront you, hope? With what shall I bow myself to God on high? You notice that? Shall I confront him with a whole burnt offering, with calves a year old? Well, let's stop there. This is how bad the nation had become. They're saying, well, you're claiming I'm doing something wrong. Well, what was I supposed to do? In verse 6, they mention, with what shall I confront your hope? With what shall I bow myself to God on high? Shall I confront him with a whole burnt offering? Well, a whole burnt offering, that was likened to a prized ram or a bull. That was an impressive offering. It was a bullock. And really, one of the highest sacrifices that you could offer in the nation of Israel would be a bull. A choice bull or a bullock is what they called it. So now they're saying, well, you said I'm doing wrong. Do I need to offer up? A whole burnt offering? Is that what I need to do? Well, is that what God's required of you? You see, today in this modern time in which we live, some individuals might say, well, am I supposed to give a lot of money? Do I need to give a lot of material things? If that's all that God's required of me, I'll just give a lot of money. I'll put a lot of money in. And you see individuals involved with false worship today. They feel that that's all they need to do. They'll, they'll put money in. And they think, well, that, that helps me to meet God's requirements. That was the problem with the nation of Israel. So instead of trying to discern what God wanted them to do, they just said, well what, well, what am I supposed to do? Okay, I'll give a lot of money. The brothers need new things at the kingdom hall. They need to fix the lights and the toilets and everything. So I'll put money in. I'll write a big check. And I'll come to the kingdom hall, and then I'm meeting God's requirements. That was the first one they brought up. Is that, is that what you're going to take? You're going to put that in one sentence and live your life according to that? I don't think you want to do that. Because you know the type of God you serve. But look what else they said. Verse 6. They said, with calves a year old. Now these calves were called yearlings. This was a choice offering also, to take a young calf and to offer that one. So many said, well, if I'm not supposed to give a lot of money, well, maybe I'll just give a, a yearling then. I'll give a young calf. And you see today, a lot of people will say, well, I'll serve Jehovah while I'm young. That's what he's requiring. I'll give him the strength of youth. Many are saying, you better get me while I'm young, because after I get a little bit older, I'm going to live for myself. Is that what God's requiring? That just while you're young, for you to seek the kingdom first while you're young? You know, many have taken that mistaken idea. They say, well, I did a lot back then. I did that already. Now I'm going to live for myself. Is that what God's requiring? You want to put that in one sentence and live your life on that? Well, I served Jehovah years ago while I was young, and now... I can do what I want to do. That was another possibility that the nation of Israel put out there. Let's look at verse 7. Will Jehovah be pleased with thousands of rams? Well, you always needed animals to make a sacrifice. So now the individual had the nerve to say, well, I'll just give a large quantity. You always need animals, so... Instead of being concerned about all that Jehovah's standards are, I'll just give a large quantity. Maybe Jehovah will be happy with that. Is that what Jehovah would be happy with? And today, many people might say, well, I'll give a large quantity. I'll be an elder. And that's giving a lot. 
They call that a 24-7 job. I'll be a ministerial servant. Maybe I'll reach out. Maybe I'll be a pioneer. Now that's what Jehovah's Witness consider a person that's out in the forefront. The Lord's involved in that. Look at verse 7 again. Now after they mentioned with thousands of rams, they said with tens of thousands of torrents of oil. Well, you needed oil in order to offer sacrifices. That's how they would burn them on the fire many times. So you needed oil. They would say, well, why don't we just give a lot of oil? Maybe that's all that Jehovah's requiring. You see how bad the nation was? It was almost as though they were being sarcastic. They said, well, is that what he wants? He wants tens of thousands of torrents of oil? You see, they get better, don't they? They're coming up with all of these possibilities, and they get better. So now a person is saying, well, I'll just endure. I'll just stay in the truth. Make sure I don't get this fellowship. They will, brothers won't have to put me out. I'll be here 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I'll just endure. I'll hang in there. That's obviously what God has required of me, for just to stay there. More is involved. Let's look again at verse 7. The final suggestion, well, you couldn't top that one. In verse 7, shall I give my firstborn son for my revolt? That's how bad they were. They said, well, you said I'm doing something bad. Should I give my firstborn son? Is that what Jehovah wants? Now, how disrespectful to talk to the God of Israel and say, does he want me to give my firstborn son? You couldn't top that one. Now that was shocking. They were exaggerating a little bit, but it showed the condition that they had become. Today a person might say, well, I'll sacrifice something that's very dear to me. I'll give up the job that I always wanted. Is that what God's requiring of me? I won't get married, okay? I just won't get married. Is that what you're requiring of me, for me to stay single? There are five possibilities they put there. Which one of them would, would you choose to build your life on? Which one tells you what God requires? Would you choose any one of them? Well, that still leaves the question then. What is God requiring of us today? Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Here it is. Jehovah told them. He has told you, O earthling man, what is good and what is Jehovah asking back from you but to exercise justice and to love kindness and to be modest in walking with your God. That's all God is required of you. To exercise justice, to love kindness, and to be modest in walking with your God. Well then, what are we saying? All of those possibilities that they gave were all external features. They were good, they were not bad, but it had absolutely nothing to do with the person that you are internally. Jehovah wants you to be the kind of person that he is. He wants you to be a just person. He wants you to love kindness. Jehovah is not modest because he does not have any limitations, but he wants you to walk with him recognizing your limitation. That's all that God is required of. He's not asking for any of these external features because it's obvious people can participate in them and still not meet God's requirements. But he wants us to be affected on the inside. In one sentence, he wants you to love kindness, to love justice, and to be modest in walking with your God. There it is. That's what God's requiring of people today. And how many are trying to discern that? How many are trying to live their lives in such a way that everything they do is justice? They will always do the kind thing. And yes, they will always walk with God recognizing their own limitations. Two sides of the issue. Where do we stay? Are we the sort of people that want to be in this camp, that live our lives in whatever way we want to, disregarding all that God would have us to do? Or are we with the group that have come to this elevated mountain, we recognize the privilege to be a part of God's people. And yes, we love kindness. We love justice. And we're modest in walking with our God. For all of those of mankind today that have met God's standards, they will forever be upon this elevated mountain. They will live as long as God lives because they've met God's approval because God says you are doing what I require 
of you. Thank you. I'm sure all 200 were encouraged by Brother Mack's talk. We want to be mindful that two congregations were assembled here today, Hilltop and Westgate. 